We're going to talk about grief today. And what is grief? Grief is sorrow, heavy, grievous, sad, intense suffering caused by emotions due to the loss, misfortune, injury, evil, regret, or suffering. To be morbid, to suffer, calamity, failure, distress, or lament. It is an emotion that is very strong. Those of us who have been through death have experienced it. The problem with people that pray for others is that you need to know about grief because you're going to meet grief. A lot of grief, especially as we travel to Cuba. Cuba is a place where grief is king. A lot of grief, a lot of sadness due to the imposition of the Communist Party over the people of Cuba, and they can't react. You have grown-up 50-year-old men driving broken bicycles. Now, grief causes a breakdown in emotional control. It tears apart emotions, emotions that you can quite bring it together by by balance, by reason, by being intelligent, and, but it breaks it down. It is one of the greatest weapons that Satan has to bind and cause a man, a woman, not to have emotions anymore. It breaks down emotions. Grief or extended grief, envy and strife breaks down emotions. You become motionless. You, you, don't, you don't respond to joy, you don't respond to gladness, you don't respond to peace, you don't respond to goodness, to kindness, to a laugh. And of course, I've been through that in the last three years, to the loss of my wife. And I had to battle it. I had to battle to a point to where I would cry without ceasing for an hour or two hours. And it's like uh, grief had a grip on my soul, on my will, my emotions. And so the will, you become unable to do what you should do or need to do about other things. You paralyze yourself. And life becomes, <laughs> becomes uh, 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 paralyzed. You're not able to react to things you have to do. For instance, you know, there are things that we have to do in terms of life. For instance, you have to pay the bills. That's, that's something normal. Then you have to sort of... Uh, 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 eat. <laughs> you know, you got to eat lunch and breakfast and dinner. It's part of life. And you stop eating. I mean, I lost a lot of weight during the, the three years that I was in, in grief. Doctors tell us that after many years of study, those who are bitter in grief or unforgiveness create a climate in the body where cancer, arthritis, and ulcer thrives. So as you, deal, as you deal with people that have cancer, you're going to find people that are very deeply, deeply, deeply involved in grief. And cancer comes in to disturb them. Arthritis becomes a major problem. Our body chemistry and functions are out of order due to the stress created by grief, unforgiveness, and bitterness. Now that comment is, is what I've experienced. Amen? But these notes are 40, 30 years old. And so let's go back to Scripture a little bit and done sound a little bit just to show you that the Bible deals with grief severely. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 16, it talks about Hannah in her prayer. In verse 15, it said, Hannah answered, in, verse 14, said, And Eli said unto her, How long will you be drunk? Put, away, put your wine away from you. Meaning she was praying. And, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the man of God saw her praying. And he thought that she was drunk. And Hannah answered, No. My Lord, 
I'm a woman with a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Evidently, Eli had not seen very much of such prayerful attitude around the tabernacle. Regretfully, most of the modern church falls into the same category. Prayers are not in intercessory mode, in tears, crying before the Lord, because uh, uh, you're grieving. You have unforgiveness in your heart. Count not your handmaid for a daughter of Belial, means worthless. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken here to, meaning I, I have spoken to God in my grief, asking him to give me a child. And I've been suffering and being in hurtful by Penina. And I'm crying because I need a baby. I'm a, I'm, 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 I don't have a baby. I, 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 my womb does not allow me to have a baby. Then on verse 17, by the way, Eli the prophet, the priest of the Lord, said, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant you a petition that you have asked of him, which is a prophetic statement. And, of course, Hannah became pregnant with Samuel, which is the last prophet in the last dispensation before the 400 years of silence. So now, grief. Want to take a look at something else? Uh, how about Psalm 6? Psalm 6, verse 7. is also, I have 15 scriptures here, and I can't go all through all of them because of time. But Psalm 6, verse 7 says this, My eye is consumed because of grief. It waxes old because of all my enemies. So David's enemies were myriads, thousands, because David was a type of Christ who was, as well, would be su surrounded by many enemies. Pharisees were enemies of David. Look at uh, Psalm 31. And, of course, Psalm 31, 9 is my favorite. Psalm 31, 9. It says, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eyes consumed with grief, yes, my soul and my belly. The grief that he has experienced as he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him, can only be measured imperfectly by mere mortals. In other words, it's impossible to, to understand what Jesus experienced because of grief. He was rejected by his loved ones, rejected by everybody. Of course, there are a lot of scriptures, 78, Psalm 78. Let me give you one more, and I'll continue the teaching, okay? On grief, 78, 78, 40. 78, 40. Here you go. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? How often? As you know, Israel with uh, over 3 million people coming out of Egypt on a trip that uh, should last 11 days turned out to be 40 years because of grief. They couldn't fit within the will of God. They had their own plans. And when you have your own plans and God has another plan, it begins to fall apart. And you can't do that because God does not reveal to you his perfect will for your life. It's one day at a time. In other words, God only gives you one hour ahead of the clock. You can be in the will of God. And why God does not, does not reveal the future? Because you can come to a situation where grief takes over you and you'll never hear the Lord again. So... Here are the scriptures. Now, I need to give you a little more scripture, one more or two. I don't, I don't think uh, 
I think I can do more than that. But let me go to Isaiah 53.3. Isaiah 53.3. We'll be along, we'll be along with, uh, with grief for quite a while, okay? It is a greatest, one of the greatest topics of people who do deliverance and ministry to others. Isaiah 53.3. It says this, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. Acquainted with grief. As we hid as, as it were our faces from him, he was despised, despised, and we esteemed him not. Him being rejected by men means one from whom men held themselves aloof. Why? He was pure holiness, and there were pure corruption. And so, and so. Okay, we did with scriptures now. Let me just, uh, after my, my wife passed away, I, I became overwhelmed with grief. I guess because being alone and my children doing their lives and working out their, their doings and their business and, and the children, there's eight grandchildren there, I had to face a house without her. But as I sought the Lord in my life, I began to seek him, looking for him. And I went into a little country church to where the pastor preaching was John Walker. John is, uh, is the husband of Cindy Walker. Uh, as you know, she... Uh, works for uh, RBM here in Athens, Georgia. And during his teaching on the Ark of the Covenant, I saw a black cloud coming out of my head, going up in the air. I saw a black cloud. And of course, that was tremendous, tremendous grief. And the first thing that I felt was in my heart, in my chest, the pain left me. I wasn't done with grief, but the pain left me. So I've experienced grief in a common sense. Those of you who lost relatives, those of you who lost loved ones, grief can paralyze you completely. I went into rebellion. I went into bitterness. And God began to deal with me. So what do you do when you are assailed by grief and unforgiveness and Bitterness, resentment. How, how do you handle that? First of all, you need deliverance. You don't need psychological counseling. You need deliverance. You need someone to come in and put the hand on your head and pray in the name of Jesus. That's what you need. And if you don't have that type of treatment, you're going to be bound up for more years, more, 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 more days, and nothing will happen to you. Just as we do not let our hands or feet do their own thing. Neither do we let our mind accept every thought that comes into it. The mind needs to be controlled. You've got to have control over your brain. You need to have control over your brain. You, neither a mind can receive more than one thought at a time. More than one source at a time. Never allow your mind to have double thoughts. It's called double-mindedness. We hear from God and Satan at the same time. When God speaks, Satan speaks at the same time. I was talking to a man in the state of Rio de Janeiro, uh, and uh, he was in the States. As I talked to him, uh, another greater voice came in and said, you will stay in the state of Rio for 15 years. And joined with the Bishop Paul Lachman, bringing revival into all the churches in the state of Rio. Today, the seventh region and the first region of the Methodist Church in Brazil are the largest, with largest number, close to a million members. I began to hear that young kids that came for counseling, 
they had thoughts of crimes and not to do it at the same time. The thought comes and then you do the crime. And so I began to work with children and young adults on how they process grief, how they process it. Satan gives an idea of pain and grief and the response is to kill somebody. They did not sort out the good from the evil and made the wrong choice. Romans 6.16 tells us that what we do, whatsoever we yield ourselves, we become servants to obey. Whosoever we yield ourselves, servants to obey. And that's whose slaves we become. We become to those slaves to those thoughts that corrode us to obey. We become slaves because we have said yes. John 10.10 10 is a famous scripture. It says Jesus comes to give life and life in abundance. My cry was, Lord, how do I get life abundantly? I learned a new song. Isaiah 60, verse 1. And I want to share this with you. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And I made that my, my, my word, my scripture, and I spent time with it. I began to sing songs. I learned a new song. I tried, but I didn't know how to arise or shine, but I kept on singing. I didn't know how to rise. Rise to what? Shine to what? Arise and shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Isaiah 61, shine. Now, arise here speaks about depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Arise to a new life. Meaning, I didn't stand up, but I began to seek people and listen from them what God is trying to tell them. So John Walker began to preach that morning at 11 o'clock service in this little church here in town. And, uh, and I began to receive. I concentrated on Jesus. Shine now. Be radiant with the glory of the Lord, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Now I knew what I was to arise from, depression and frustration. Each time I tried to arise, a ton of weight held me down. Every time. And I tell you, I went to all, several places, several churches, several places. I, I was just looking for somebody to help me. I knew that I was trapped with grief. I knew that I couldn't get out of the cemetery. I knew that I, I, I was unhappy. I knew that I was not eating properly. I knew that I had lost a lot of weight. I knew that it was close to depression upon me. But I began to cry out. I began to seek the Lord. I began to say, God, speak to me. Have, I want to be where you want me to be right now. Let's take a look at uh, Isaiah 61 which is a very popular scripture, okay? Verses 1 through 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. This is, this is a quotation of scripture as Jesus began his ministry in the upper uh, 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 Israel and in the, in the area of the Lake of Galilee. He's in a synagogue he comes and opens Isaiah on chapter 61, verse 1. And he speaks what the prophet spoke, meaning, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Now, I'm reading that scripture, and I'm brokenhearted, and I had no idea what to do with me. And I'm saying, God, I'm brokenhearted. And I'm crying my head off. You know, and I think John recognized that uh, way in the back, last seat in the congregation, I was crying. 
you, you, you bind me up. To the, to, he, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim captivity unto the captives. Liberty unto the captives. In the opening of the prison to them who are bound. And I was bound. I was bound as bound as you can get. Now, Jesus came to preach the gospel. Bind and heal the brokenhearted. Proclaim liberty to the physical and spiritual captives. And I knew physically I was bound up and spiritually I was bound up. Opening of the prison in the eyes of the blind, meaning I couldn't see Scripture or be fed by Scripture because grief engulfed my whole being. To great consolation and joy to those that mourn. Of course, how can you have joy? I witnessed a, a funeral yesterday in the city of Marietta, Georgia, of a lady called Susan Nutter. And after the children spoke, the husband, David Nutter, began to preach. And let me tell you, I have never heard a sermon as powerful an hour, I would say, of David Nutter preaching the word of God to his children. It was full of power, full of glory, full of mercy. I called him and left a message and told him that he preached the best sermon, I think, that church has ever heard. And so, to grant consolation and joy to those that mourn, consolation and joy, consolation and joy. As soon as that pain left me, I went to the parking lot, and I began to lift my hand inside of my car, saying, Lord, give me the joy of the Lord. I know my wife had to go, and you needed her. And uh, I want my joy back. To give beauty for ashes, praise for falling spirit, and build oaks of righteousness that the Lord be glorified. Grief does not bring glory to the Lord, but joy. Joy. Praise and righteousness do. Let me read it again. Grief does not bring glory to the Lord, but joy, praise, and righteousness do. Verse 4 says that after all this is done, they, the people, will rebuild their ruined lives in cities. You, you look at that uh, on verse, uh, on verse, uh, verse 3. To appoint unto them who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, oil for joy for, for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Amen. And they shall build the old wastes. They shall rise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities and desolations of many generations. Oh, my goodness. I don't want to preach on that, but it's talking about the future is reestablished. New parameters are established. New calls, new revelation of the Lord. And things begin to change. I realized I was asking God to fix the circumstances around me that I should have been at work at it. I was asking God to fix the circumstances. The death of my Lucy. And the Lord simply couldn't do it. So I was continuously asking how. Right off I saw more scripture after I saw the scripture about forgiveness. And so I asked Mary Lucy to forgive me. I asked Mary Lucy to have mercy on me. See, when you live with a woman for 52 years, and you're the only call of God, you begin realizing that God uses her, and she took care of me for 52 years as I travel all over. I think I've been to every single state in the United States of America. I've been to New England states, I've been to every. I, I've been to Maryland. I've been to Connecticut. You know what that is? It's way up there. I've been there. I preached over there. I I I, I think I I wore out a pair of pants and a guitar strings, preaching and singing. I baptized homosexuals in in uh, in, in in Delaware, Rehova Beach. I never forget that. My Lord, 
Now let's go to let's go to deal with unforgiveness for a little bit. Open your Bible in Mark eleven. Mark eleven. And there's a word for you here, Mark eleven. I told you that we're going to stay on this topic this week and next week because of, the, of how important it is because there's a lot of people dying out there and people are just devastated with grief. We've got to deal with that. It's a part of deliverance that I enjoy the most. So let's take Mark eleven twenty two. Mark eleven twenty two. 22. Amen. Here we go. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily, verily, I say unto you that whosoever says shall unto this mountain thou be removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe in those things which he says shall come to pass he shall have whatsoever he says so the instruction here is to ask for forgiveness when there is unforgiveness the body simply reacts and what happens with the body is that it does not develop and create patterns of reshaping the body. And the body becomes stagnated. You put the problem away in the past and you let it be in the past and you hide it. And before too long, your body it speaks clearly to what your spirit has been crying out for years to get it done. So I have to forgive my wife for dying for, on me. Myself for thinking I could have prevented it. I ask God to forgive me for blaming him. I blame him. I blame me. I blame Mary Lucy for dying in the worst time of my life. So forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. You can put that baby under the, under, the, under, under the bed and hide for 20 or 30 years, but it will one day have to be dealt with. God does not use people with unforgiveness. You can do all you want. Now, listen, I've been preaching for 65 years. I learned my lesson. So stop telling me that that's not right. I have lived 65 years preaching 65 years. And I've realized that unforgiveness and grief, it corrodes the spirit. I remember what happened to me during those years of unforgiveness. So forgiveness does not mean forgetting. It means let it drop, live it, and let it go. Allow the Holy Spirit to remove from you that which caused you a lot of harm in the past. Count the offense unimportant compared to what Jesus did for me. Count the offense, what happened there, unimportant compared to what Jesus did for you. And I did. I did. I said, Lord, I, I, I died to self. Didn't do it. I blamed my wife. It didn't do it. I blamed you. It didn't do it. But finally, finally, when I decided to be truthful to what happened to me, I forgave myself. As I came to forgive, much of the ton of weight fell off me. It was like a ton of bricks. Bone and marrow and spirit and soul began to be revived. And I began to go back and preach again. We went to Brazil and we had an experience of deliverance at Cariacica Church in the city of Vitoria, Espiritu Santo State, in Brazil. And the deliverance there was phenomenal. Anybody that was there was delivered like you've never seen before. Heavenly Father, as we continue this series on grief and unforgiveness, I ask in the name of Jesus that those who are hearing me will be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen.